first job I did when I left school, I worked for an advertising agency, a very well-known one. That was in 1944. I was 14 years old. And at that time, we were under continuous attack by V1. We called them buzz bombs, uh, doodlebugs. And for the sort of thing I had to do when I went with the firm was they put you on the, the roof because as it was basically a 24-hour air raid, they couldn't stop working. It was a big firm and they had to get the work out somehow. So they used to put a kid up like myself on the roof with a whistle and a hooter and a, a blow tube. So if you saw a buzz bomb coming your way, then uh, you blew down the hooter, blew the whistle and made a terrible clatter and everybody got underneath uh, their tables or their desks or what have you and died for cover. And I suppose I was a bit leery as a kid. In fact, all kids are. And I used to kid myself. I used to see a buzz bomb coming, say, from the dish. Oh, I was trying to patch me with my mouthpiece going, mm. oh, that one's going to miss us. That one's going to miss us. Where's another one? Mm. Oh, that one's going to miss us. Don't bother with that one. Oh, that one's going to miss us. I'll leave that one. Then the engine cut out. I thought, oh, that's going to miss us. I sort of put my hands on my ears, waiting for it to go off bang. And it didn't go off bang. So I looked up, and the bloody thing was coming straight towards us. And it went crunch about maybe a hundred years, hundred yards away. And of course, nobody in the firm knew that it was landing. And it blew the windows out, and I got the biggest rollicking ever. My first trumpet was uh, when I was about 14 or 15. And my dad said he'd put up the money to get me one, which is nice of him. And I saw one advertised in the Melody Maker, which is a, a English newspaper, it's a musical newspaper. And uh, it was ten pounds. And it was in North London, a place called Kenton, which from my area is uh, about 26 tube stops away. And I got in the tube one Saturday morning. I phoned up and found out it was still for sale. I got in the tube one Saturday morning and I went over there with my 10 pounds and my dad busting the pocket. After about two hours, I eventually got there, got up to the house and knocked on the door and there was this argument going, I could hear something going. I had to wait about 10 minutes before they eventually opened the door and this, they invited me in and uh, they said, yes, sir, well, about the trumpet. I said, yes, I'll come about the trumpet in the advertised for £10. They said, oh, well, it's, um, it's uh, now £8.50. I said, oh, that's fine, thanks very much. Said, but unfortunately, we've had an accident. And they showed it to me, and the whole, the whole bloody bell, they, they, they slung at each other, they had a terrible argument. He wanted to be a trumpet player, and she didn't want to because of, because of the noise. And they bent the bell completely around there, so that it was facing that way. <laughs> And I, I didn't care, I, I just wanted a trumpet, whether it was standing up near or, or even turned inside out, I just wanted the trumpet. So I said, yes, I, I'll have it, thanks very much, let me have it for 8.50. And I got it in a sort of little cotton bag, shoved it in, and as I got out, out the garden, I waited on goodbye, I bent it. I bent it straight. I couldn't resist sort of playing. As I got home, I went down the street, and I, I, I really gave it a hell of a blast down the street. So I was saying, yeah, yeah, I'm here, I've got it, I've got it, I've got it. They said, well, look at the bloody condition. I said, yeah, but I got it for 8.50. And that was my first trumpet, and I, it, it actually cracked, the, the bell cracked, but uh, I got somebody to solder it up. It worked for a while. And uh, this is about my, I suppose, about my ninth one now, ninth or tenth trumpet. I seem to go through them pretty quick. I went down to St. James Infirmary Just to see my baby there She was all stretched out on a long white table So cold, so dark and so bare Now let her go let her go, God bless her Wherever she may be Wherever she may be He can't search his whole wide world right over But she ain't never gonna find a trumpet player Just as bad as me
die, I want you to bury me in a straight lace suit. Box back coat, and a station hat on my head. Put a $20 gold piece on my watch chain so the buzzer knows. I got a job in a band called Sid Phillips, or Sid Phillips and his band. He's a marvellous man, tremendous fella. And the trumpet player, who was before me, Sir Ellis, he, he was a singer. He did some songs with the band. And they had all the arrangements, so one day Sid came to me and said, um, do you sing? I said, no. He said, well, you are tomorrow. He said, this is the worst to make misbehaving, you're on. So I, you know, immediately panicked and uh, thought, what the hell can I do? So I learned the words and, and learned the arrangement. And I went on. Virtually within 24 hours, I've been told I was going to sing in front of a packed house at Southport, a uh, concert in Southport, which is north of England, uh, and, and did all right. I think Sid probably got a lot of uh, sympathetic applause from the audience, but it seemed to go down quite well, and I've been singing ever since. But uh, one thing I do notice about the early days of singing, that my voice was considerably higher, and I, obviously that came about through the, the sort of the panic stricken hysteria you get with nerves, and then after. After a few years of maturity and not feeling a bit more relaxed about the singing and trying to sing a bit more jazzified, for want of a better word, and put more interpretation in the words, I find that my, my voice has dropped about a half an octave. So those top notes I can't get anymore. Uh, well, if I do want to get them, I have to have a very tight jock strap. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Oh, <laughs> my